Yeah, for the judges, we started on Friday with a kickoff at 6 p.m. Eastern time. And from there, all of these strangers had to come together, pitch ideas that fell into this track in some way, and find each other and form teams out of the blue. Um, and they did all of this through Slack, like the ability for you guys to use these virtual mechanisms to do this. I know, you know, challenges and hackathons are usually people in the same room, finding each other, talking to each other face to face. And you were able to do all of this via Slack and via Zoom and via Google Sheets and the phone. And there you work with teammates across time zones. And it's just been so inspiring to watch. And I can't wait to see what you guys have done. Um, so yeah, we started on Friday night with the little kickoff. There was, you know, problem pitching and team formation that went all through the night. And then the teams registered with their idea and the folks who they wanted to work with at 10 a.m. Eastern on Saturday. And since then, we've had over 250 mentors who have been at the ready to help these teams run through their ideas and answer specific questions and help share their expertise. And the ideas just kept getting honed more and more. And we had practice pitches on Saturday night and then this morning. And this is a culmination of all of that. We're going to hear from about 20 teams on you know, how they want to tackle this problem and try and help in this time of crisis. So that said, you know, we, like I said, we, we pitched, the folks found each other, they've been hacking away, they've gotten a ton of feedback and they've iterated on their ideas a ton. And so I'm actually really excited from the, from the pulse check-ins yesterday to see how the ideas have changed and how you guys have polished them up. So the judging criteria, which you've kind of been aware of, uh, for a while. Um, we're really looking during this challenge at the impact you could have. So how immediately could this happen and what's the size of the impact? Is it an innovative solution? And have you taken the real life user experience into account? Implementation is really looking at how feasible is this to be implemented, maybe by one of our challenge partners or in the short term. We know that this disease is totally unprecedented and it's going to look a lot different in two weeks and it's going to look a lot different in a month and we really have no idea. So the problems that we're facing right now and that we're going to face in the short to medium term, how are we able to implement this super quickly, deploy it and scale it? And then finally, we're going to be judging you on your presentation. Was it effective? How are the teams put together? All that. So with that, I will give the judges each a moment to introduce themselves. Um, Nikki, would you like to kick off? We've got a really amazingly cool judging panel on G. Hi there. Can you hear me good? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, Nikki Tesler. Um, I'm one of the divisional vice presidents at Universal Health Services, and we're very interested in the problem that you are solving. And I can't thank you enough for your generosity and your brain power today. Uh, looking forward to the wonderful uh, solutions that you've come and, and the idea of test betting it at UHS is quite in, uh, exciting for me. So thank you for having me. Thanks, Nikki. How about Chris? Hey guys, such a privilege to be here. Thank you so much for including me. Uh, my name is Chris Lee. I'm actually a former co-director of Hacking Medicine back in 2015, 2016. Um, currently, uh, I'm a co-founder of a company called Infinite MD. Uh, we do uh, virtual specialty care where we connect you know, patients to specialists virtually. So it's you know interesting in our day to day as we're shifting and adapting. Um, so look forward to hearing what everyone's worked on over the course of this weekend. Awesome, Zach. Hi everybody. This is Zachary Pohl, head of U.S. Healthcare Partnerships for Plug and Play. We're a VC firm um, in the Bay. I um, also work with U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to be able to find technology to uh, mitigate. COVID-19 and also launching a COVID-19 specific accelerator. I'm uh, really looking forward to hearing all of your solutions uh, and thank you again for all the work that you've been doing. Thank you. How about Khalil? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, such a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited to hear what you guys have been working on. Um, I'm a postdoc fellow at, at uh, MIT. I'm also one of the former co-directors of Hacking Medicine. Um, but yeah, looking, pretty excited to see what you guys have been working on. Very cool. We're really excited to have you guys. Thank you for taking the time. I mean, you know, Nikki, you've been here all weekend. Zach, you guys have really helped out these teams already and can't wait for you to see what they've done. So this is, you know, this is our event. We've had over 40 partners join, like the teams have been hacking away from Friday till today. 
the MIT COVID-19 challenge is a series of virtual hackathons and virtual challenges. Uh, we had an idea-a-thon two weeks ago. This week, obviously, is, is the Beat the Pandemic challenge. And we're really just going to kind of keep it going and keep it rolling until until we find some really good solutions to this and you know we know that the needs today are going to be very different than they're going to be in two weeks and in a month like i said and so you know the focus of the next event will probably be on different and eventually hopefully <laughs> the focus of the event will be on how do we transition to the new normal because it's all behind us and now maybe we have special needs done so just a little bit of context this is a fully volunteer-led event so Alfonso Martinez from MIT and I and Freddie and Paul Chief from the Martin Trust Center have kind of been working on this to just bring this to life for less than a month now. So all of the stuff you see here, everything that's been kind of <laughs> cobbled together and, and, and put together and all the folks that we've been able to get on board and um, yeah, that's all just been kind of within the last month, we've really tried to get it up and running as quickly as possible, just knowing that this is such a crisis and that the needs change so quickly. So thank you for all of your patience and for kind of bearing with us through some of the bumpier parts, but we're so excited to be able to bring this to you and, and to, uh, to see this come to life. All right, with no further ado, we are going to pass it off to team number one, Sanity and COVID-19. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and See if you guys can grab the share screen yourselves and unmute yourselves. Perfect. All right, we see you. Beautiful. All right, and Shannon's going to be taking the time and she's going to yell at you, <laughs> right? <us through. laughs> and then give the judges two minutes to give you feedback. And then we're going to go right into the next team. We might give the judges like 10 seconds to finish up their feedback forms and then we'll jump into the next team. So go for it. Beautiful. Everybody ready to go? Awesome. So, hello everyone. We are mental health coverage now. Um, one thing that we learned this weekend is that 47 million American adults are living with a diagnosable mental illness. We also learned that 43% of this population actually sought care in 2018. And so with more than half of those mental health conditions untreated, we have a great concern for growing vulnerable populations, specifically the 16 million Americans who are facing unemployment as a result of COVID-19. 3.5 million of these Americans are actually you know, facing loss of insurance coverage as well. So our key problem area is people who are unemployed individuals who are two times more likely to develop mental health disorders. And so to give you an idea, this is the current unemployment site for Massachusetts and it's kind of a dumpster fire. And so what we are learning is that there's a gap where we can provide some of these resources by creating a smart platform um, on the unemployment site, whether it's Mass or another state regulated site, um, to coordinate health coverage and services specifically um, for those people who are at greater risk for developing a mental illness. So we are foundation to the community partnership between peers and mental health providers. Uh, the way this is going to work is it's going to connect newly unemployed people with resources for assisting and navigating those mental health services at the point of uh, registering for unemployment. All right, so, you know, in this journey, who are the people who are affected? Of course, we have the people who are recently unemployed. We have their commercial insurance providers. We have healthcare providers, and we have pharmacists. We want to keep them all in the loop as that recently unemployed person uh, changes their circumstances. The user journey is going to look something like this. You become employed, unemployed as a result of COVID-19. You log into mass.gov to engage in the unemployment prompts. Our chatbot would engage with you. And if you choose to engage back, you will explore the Mental Health Coverage Now platform, which will provide you with resources such as more affordable health insurance, as well as additional insight in mental health resources so that you gain confidence to create an action plan. And so from there, we would form our implementation plan. So the primary source of funding we're going for are state and local government action from the Coronavirus Relief Act. $28.5 billion has been allocated to these causes. So we're looking to uh, feed into that. From there, we would form partnerships with different companies like Mental um, Crisis Text Line Now. We would build our user journey end to end, um, develop the back end functions to be on the- 30 seconds left. Yeah, to be on the state websites, um, mass.gov being one of the examples. Ideally, we would have this spread to all of them. 
Right. So uh, these are some of our potential partners that we have discovered over the past weekend. But how do you want to partner with us? This is an opportunity to steer traffic towards stakeholders and partners to positively affect a lot of people's lives in these current circumstances. So over the weekend, we were able to form a cross-functional team with a passion for solving these complex healthcare issues. Any questions? Perfect. Time's up. Awesome. Should I stop sharing my screen? I mean, you can leave it up. So we have two minutes for judging judges Q and A. So judges, feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. Hey guys, great presentation. I have a quick question. Um, in terms of the resources that you guys are connecting with, you guys just uh, said healthcare providers. Could you elaborate a little bit more in terms of what kind of providers? Are these all physicians or are these like, you know, uh, other, other individuals? Uh, yeah, I can, yeah I, can, I can speak to that quickly. I mean, I think there's the opportunity. Obviously, we wanted to have two, two options. One, to be able to give people <clears throat> resources that are readily available, free resources that are available at the point when they're using the interface. The, the bigger idea is to be able to partner with community providers, um, health systems, et cetera, to be able to, um, you know, essentially drive business or traffic to those providers who would be available probably to additionally help them navigate some of these resources, but to let them know that, um, you know, there's mental health resources that are out there and still available. Got it. Hi guys, I have a quick question. What, what do you see as um, how quickly you could deploy this? What would be your uh, implementation pipeline? Honestly, I think we could implement this within a few weeks. Um, obviously, you know, if we were able to get uh, greater amount of resources, we could do this in, you know, a week-long sprint, essentially. We had a really cool team. It was almost like the perfect storm for a team, mental, you know, folks with mental health background, insurance, um, software engineering, and then obviously um, physician input. So really cool, balanced team. Can you explain a little bit more on how the business model works? Uh, yeah, so we are looking to uh, harvest funding from those different um, government um, coronavirus acts that have been put in place. And so that's the main way that we're trying to go for this. Our next move would be to, you know, partner with one of these organizations like the Massachusetts government website. All right, great. I Is think there that's a reason? all the time we have for Q&A at this point. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. I believe Covengers is up next if they want to share. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can I go ahead and take over a screen sharing if that's okay? Give me one second because I do want to make sure that Oh, sorry. I guess I can just call it out. So <laughs> it was just on the presentation. So right now is Covengers. Up next is Telepsych. Go for it. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Darshul Choksi, and I'm here with my team to talk to you today about proximity health. In today's new reality, end-stage renal disease patients represent one of the most vulnerable populations as they're dependent upon their in-center dialysis treatments. In 2016, there were nearly 500,000 patients in the U.S. that were on dialysis. The new CDC guidelines outline that these treatments are essential and should not be stopped. As a result, they also allow for the care of COVID and non-COVID patients under the same roof, as long as there's partitioning of the treatment room into a separate section for COVID patients. Considering that these patients visit these facilities three to four times a week for up to a total of 12 hours a week, they're routinely at risk for exposure. Take Mr. Smith, for example, a 65-year-old end-stage renal disease patient who's been receiving dialysis treatments for the past three years. In the new reality, he's terrified of entering a crowded treatment center surrounded by up to 50 other individuals. Skipping treatments, however, is a major risk to his life. Now, in an ideal world, one might ask, why not just provide home care for every dialysis patient? However, considerations such as the size of a patient's house, sterility concerns, and the physically demanding nature of self-administered dialysis makes this widespread use limited. Through our mobile units, however, we can provide a safer, intermediate option that replicates the in-center dialysis experience for Mr. Smith. 
Staffed by a registered nurse and a driver, the units would provide hemodialysis right outside the patient's home. Two patients could be treated in a non-COVID model and one in a COVID model. Operating on two eight-hour shifts, we could treat eight non-COVID and four COVID patients daily. Additionally, on-site storage features would allow for evaluation of the effectiveness of the dialysis protocols through collection of blood samples that would be analyzed at a partner lab. So on the right there, you can see our operating cost estimate for a single unit in the first year. This would be used to determine price points for possible revenue models, which include a pay-per-use fee, or a global fee or factoring agreements with Davida and Fresenius, who account for 80% of the market share in the dialysis space. In terms of implementation plan, we would want to establish a proof of concept in the two states that have the highest number of patients on dialysis, California and Texas. Through a fleet of units, we could offload 30% of our in-center dialysis burden in these states. We yeah, estimate it could take Okay, we estimate it could take three to four weeks to create one operational unit. And after this, we could scale nationally and globally while investigating several applications in a post COVID world. For example, the chronic disease management in rural areas. Thank you so much for your time and we hope you'll join us in bringing this vision to life. Great, we have two minutes for Q and A. Hi, this is uh, Zachary Pohl, Hook'em Horns. Uh, one question is why shouldn't Davida and Fresenius uh, do this uh, by themselves? Why do they need you? Um, I think essentially the, the value we would provide is we would be uh, taking on the, the logistics and resources required to partner with um, you know, a company that would provide the vehicles, um, the design. So I don't think that in this current state, they have time to do that. So this is where we would bring that value to them. Um, I have two questions. Uh, first one is, I'm just curious about the logistics. Is there precedent for loading up all the necessary equipment into a mobile platform? Have people done that? And two, you mentioned eight non-COVID and then four COVID. I'm just curious about that number distribution or if it's just 12 per day and you can do it whatever you want, whatever you want with it. Um, so for the eight non-COVID and four COVID, um, we wanted to treat uh, two non-COVID patients on a single unit. And based on the 18-hour operational model, we could provide four treatments. And then for a COVID unit, we could only do one treatment. So we would be able to see four treatments. Um, and there actually is um, precedent for being able to um, uh, deliver dialysis in these mobile units. Um, however, it hasn't really been... Um, implemented with some of the other features that we'd want to be able to do, such as telehealth, and it hasn't been um, scaled at all either. Cool, thank you. Any other do you questions? have revenue numbers? Um, uh, I think, uh, Humsini, do you want to speak to this or, or Aisha? I'll, I'll speak to it. Um, we don't particularly have revenue num numbers that we can share, but it's something that we can definitely work on that. But the idea is that we could uh, play around with a paper uh, per use model and partner with um, these giants such as Davida and Fresenius. We're more interested in looking at providing this as a service since these um, companies are already working and on a reimbursement model with the insurance companies and Medicaid. So if we could work on a global fee model or as a per use model, that's where we would be looking into a more of a generating revenue for our service. All right, thank you guys. That's all the time we have. So up next is our site. So if you guys could please share your screen. Um, and after that will be Agora Health. So um, Agora Health, please prepare to share your screen next. Hi, am I good to share the screen? Yes.
think the share screen button is at the bottom of the Zoom app. Is it working? Yes, it's working now. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Hi, we're Telepsych, a telepsychiatry database that connects people seeking mental health professionals with professionals and paraprofessionals. So during this time, so social isolation can cause mental health issues like loneliness, which can have an effect comparable to smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. A study conducted right after the quarantine from the SARS pandemic in 2004 showed that there is a significant increase in PTSD and depression cases. As college students, the effect of the drastic change in environment on mental health is especially important to us. As one Harvard student stated, many students now lack the in-person access to mental health they could previously receive. Students reliant on on-campus mental health resources have now lost that support. Other barriers they face are being expected to pay even with the most lenient financial plans. To meet the increase in demand, there is currently no good streamlined way to find providers with established telehealth platforms and accepting new patients. Our solution is Telepsych, which is a platform that matches patients to psychiatrists as soon as possible during the pandemic. We'll list the available uh, most updated psychiatry services at this time, and we'll have a screening quiz to filter the psychiatrist options for patients based on their backgrounds and preferences. We'll also be enlisting retired psychiatrists and students as volunteers so we can provide more free services for uninsured patients as well. So here you can see a prototype of our database. Um, you can see that you can sign up as a patient, as a certified professional, or as a paraprofessional volunteer. Uh, to implement our idea, we consulted a practicing psychologist mentor to ask about feasibility, and he confirmed that it would help greatly to have a database of available providers and patients. He also mentioned that med students doing rotations or doctors doing residency would be great candidates because they're abundantly available. And we were told that retired doctors often go back to work part time so they could even be used to train med students. We also need to consider beta testing of our service, which would entail having a sample of students with increased mental health issues due to the coronavirus situation and psychiatric professionals with a wide range of experience. To have a good sample size, these people would ideally come from one metropolitan location like Los Angeles because it is so diverse. And then once our service is up and running, we can grow by marketing to potential users with social media and then also potentially generate ad revenue on the website. Um, thank you for listening. Great, thanks guys. Um, we have two minutes for Q&A. Hey guys, I have a quick question regarding, because um, you guys are talking about listing a lot of volunteers and potentially students. Can you comment a little bit on maybe some of the licensing and regulations um, that you guys would have perhaps explored? Um, yeah, so um, the student volunteers would be, so as suggested to us by our mentor, who is a professional in this area, um, the retired, many retired psychiatrists um, like to work part-time, but they would also help in training some of these students. And the paraprofessional part of this database would be, um, with the, there would be a disclaimer that it would not be certified professional advice. And so um, that part would be under a different disclaimer, um, but there would also be available professional advice. Zachary Paul here. How do you uh, see yourselves as differentiating than the other telehealth platforms out there like Talkspace? So we're targeting mostly the um, people who are affected, their mental health issues are affected by the pandemic in place right now. And we want to um, implement a feasible, like quick solution to um, those people who are going through a drastic change. and we're listing like the available psychiatry services that um, are in place right now, because that, that can be hard to find at this time as well. And then the, the, the actual product though is um, like an interaction with someone that gives you, you guidance yeah. or like a, what, what's the actual product? 
that comes to mind as an entire career. So the actual platform is more of like the database itself, which allows um, us to match patients to um, the professionals or paraprofessionals um, so that they can get the mental health care that they need. And each professional would be um, like separately. So once they were matched, it would be direct interaction between the patient and professional through the professional's own um, telehealth platforms. All right, guys, that's all the time we have. Thanks so much. Um, up next, we have Agora Health. So if you guys can share your screen and after that, we'll have Operation Hope. So um, please prepare to share your slides after uh, this next presentation. All right, so, <clears throat> excuse me, do you see my screen here, the Agora Health? Yeah, yeah we can see it, you can begin. All right, great. Um, Let's start now then. Um, hi, I'm Stephen Greenwich, and we are Agora Health. Our goal is to increase the supply of healthcare providers to vulnerable populations who are being impacted the most by the COVID-19 crisis. We all know that COVID-19 is a massive crisis, but what some people don't realize is the asymmetry of the impact. Lower income, marginalized, and vulnerable communities are bearing the brunt of COVID-19. In the Bronx, for example, which is lower than average life expectancy and high incidence of chronic health conditions like asthma and diabetes, those infected with COVID-19 died at a rate three times higher than those just a river away in Manhattan. Rural communities, for example, tend to be older with more chronic illness, making people more at risk of severe COVID-19. At the same time of this crisis imbalance, we have a national shortage of healthcare providers, which clearly manifests in the data around telehealth supply. Usage of certain platforms has skyrocketed up to 400% and wait times have gone from average of five minutes up to 70 minutes. A large number of physicians could, could help give care but they're stuck self-isolating at home and sheltering at home with no clear path guiding them to utilize their medical expertise to folks remotely during this time of need. Agora Health enables the sat home population of the medical community to quickly onboard onto telehealth for the first time, connecting them to this unprecedented demand. We use a web application, existing video technology, and recent deregulation to connect underserved patients to providers. We handle scheduling, billing, and reimbursements. Our marketplace of providers is curated to serve the local and regional needs of these communities by partnering with leaders of these patients, leaders that these patients know and trust, such as faith-based faith organizations, schools, and community centers. Our business model is pretty simple. Similar to something like services like Airbnb and Uber, um, we take a flat service fee. So telehealth is on average cost $79, of which we would take a $10 fee. Um, here's our team. Myself, I have years of experience building, building and shipping telemedicine solutions at scale at 98.6 in Amwell. I'm currently studying healthcare innovation and entrepreneurship at UCSF. Um, Jinzi has an MD and MBA and is the med medical director of innovation at Nevada Health Center. And Nikhil is an MD candidate at Wayne State University. Uh, here's some great mentors we met over the weekends. And now I want to share with you some wireframes we put together. So here is the, the patient experience. Um, so Agora Health landing page, uh, some basic information folks can log in. Um, really just see a variety of services available. Here's kind of some ideas of where we're thinking of starting. Um, Recent regulation has allowed these to be billed over Medicare and private insur insurances will um, likely follow suit to allow direct reimbursement of these services via telehealth. Um, here's, what it might look like. oh, okay. here's what it might look like for patient scheduling, um, similar to a website like TaskRabbit, um, where you can find providers uh, and schedule appointments. Um, and then you get a notification that the provider will be calling you. Um, from the provider experience, log in, see your upcoming appointments, see what video platform they prefer. Um, once you finish that visit, send a care plan and invoice directly from the app. So um, thanks a lot, I'll now take questions. I have a quick question um, regarding Amwell. How does this interface with that platform or how do you see the point of difference between uh, Amwell and what you're proposing, if you don't mind elaborating? Yeah, so Amwell and many other telemedicine companies, they hire providers on staff. Um, but what we're going to be doing is building a marketplace so folks who have never done telehealth before can easily sign up similar to an Uber driver would sign up to um, drive a car and uh, it allows them to establish their own independent practice and work flexible hours. Um, so the idea is they can download the app, easily start giving care on their own schedule and we take care of the rest. Do you see any issues with um, matching provider availability and specialty with the patient who's coming on, um, who is the right match at that time? Um, 
I think there is a bit of complexity there, but I don't think it's, it's too complex. I think if we have a database of providers, we're going to be asking them for the licenses, their qualifications, their background, and then patients are going to be coming in seeking specific types of care. I think we'll be able to make that connection um, um, uh, quite easily. How many providers do you envision you'll need in order to kind of have a streamlined process for a patient to come on and then be quickly matched with the right provider? Yeah, I'd love to, you know, start out like five or 10 in each category um, and then scale and expand from there, as well as kind of as we, as we grow, see which providers are most in demand and then scale up in that area in particular. So see where the demand is and then really grow in that space. It's, it's hard to predict because um, some, some of the providers will be full time um, because they'll be sheltering in place, but some of them are going to be part-timers. For example, 31% of all female physicians only work part-time because they need something a little more flexible. So we plan on, you know, um, basically using all of those people um, for our platform. Uh, one question I had um, is if you guys have given thought to what category you think would be the most, you know, best place to start, biggest need, and possibly untapped supply. Primary this is the last question and we'll move on. Primary care, for sure. Um, so I, I work for an FQHC um, and I, I work with this population. And what we're finding is that in a lot of places, community health centers are actually shutting down because there's not enough um, equipment and supplies to keep them open. So something like this would be amazing for those people. Great, thank you so much. Um, so up next, we're going to have Operation Hope. So if you guys can share your screens, and then after that, we're going to have Cove ER. Okay, can you all see my screen? No, we can't. No, can not yet. Press. Great, we can see your screen now. Do you all see that it's loading? That's what I'm seeing. Yes. Okay, I'm just checking. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. I won't start the time until you get to start your presentation. Okay, thank you. Hi, we're Operation Hope, and we're here to gamify the health behavior promotion and outreach. We have a problem. With everything that's going on throughout the entire world due to the COVID-19 pandemic, People are still not adhering to the social guideline, guideline, the social distancing guidelines. Since the primary offenders are youth, we are looking to reach this population through a game-based solution where we can target this group and educate while establishing incentives to maintain social distancing. Our solution centers on the Hope Garden, which is a digital succulent garden that you can grow by participating in social trivia competitions and maintaining six feet of distance from other phones. Failing to maintain enough distance will lead your plants to wither, a lighthearted form of punishment reinforcing the importance of this behavior. Of course, you can whitelist necessary contacts or geographical zones. We envision the garden as a social engagement element where other users can visit and you can customize the layout. There's a lot of information on COVID available, ranging from very accurate but painfully dry resources to engaging but accurate ones. We strive to provide the high quality data that's available on websites like the CDC in a more engaging and user-friendly method to best serve our target audience. While the Operation Hope app is free to download, some gen income generation is mainly centered around delivering virtual goods to users through in-app purchases and through in-app advertisements. We're committed to a low touch model that relies on technological approaches and minimizes the need for human interactions for business operations. Our business model is designed to be sustainable where multiple health centric app feature rollout phases will not only help with the social distancing during the current COVID crisis, but will also promote continued usage of the app after the COVID disease has subsided. We'll be able to we bring to the table a unique value proposition, the gamification of material crafted for promotion of positive health behaviors, and no direct competitors could be identified, making this space open for growth within our platform. Now for our business developing strategy, 
Uh, it has two core areas, operation during and after the acute phase of the COVID pandemic. Our first steps are to implement the social distancing and educational strategies with long-term goals of establishing closer B2B partnerships and increasing the types of data that are collected to monitor for various health indicators. To fast track our idea, thank you. To fast track our idea, we want to integrate some of the aspects into existing popular games like Animal Crossing um, and other types of building games to combat the, combat the social distancing adherence problem by next month. As for the Hope Garden feature, we expect two weeks of, for development of our game through personal contacts, along with one to two weeks of beta testing in one of our university communities. To reach a higher user base, we're thinking to integrate this with a bigger gaming app such as Quiz Up or House Party, for which we'll develop a system for health data collection through gamification. So who are we? We are organized by a diverse team of creative thinkers and our expertise spans the field of clinical medicine, public health, biological and neurosciences and engineering and product development. And now we'll take questions. So we only have about a minute and a half for questions because we went a little bit over. How do you know that these incentives and that the advice on how to be better for social distancing, because I think most people already know that, how do you think that this will actually have an impact or have data around whether that will have an impact? We don't actually think that this population is that knowledgeable about what's going on in all honesty because of the seemingly changelessness of their lives. They don't get to see exactly what's going on in hospitals and they're not as news savvy as like, um, like I guess more, I hate to say this word, but more woke ages are people that are more uh, in tune with what's going on. And so we think that the game will reach these types of groups. Do you have any data to support that? Oh, well, oh, kids play games. So it's, it, it's very popular. Um, you can look on almost any, uh, almost any game. Uh, so the two aspects, one aspect is about uh, gamification that has, that has been a rise in the, and since the COVID-19 pandemic started, there has been a real uh, rise, about 30 to 40% rise in amount of games used. And the fact that their ignorance is there, uh, based on the news articles and based on the reporting of what uh, what the younger population has been doing so far against social distancing, of going to uh, public places, going to the beaches without uh, without care for the society, has has been the trigger for this uh, development. So it's two aspects of it: the gamification rise, uh, rise of games, and also the ignorance of the population. Great, thank you. So much. Um, we're going to move on to our uh, next group, which is CoVR. So if you guys can please share your screen, and after that we'll have PlanWise. So PlanWise, please prepare to share your stuff for this presentation. Hi. Can everyone see our screen? Yes. Uh, let me know when I should start. You can begin. Okay. Hi, we're here to introduce uh, Recover. So here's Joe, and who just flew in from San Francisco and who's feeling a sore throat. He got nervous and afraid that he might be contracted with COVID-19. So these are some of the thoughts that he had. He was on countless websites and tools online, but he was only to, uh, told to self-isolate at home without giving further instructions on how. What's worse is that the city is currently on lockdown, so he struggled to install 10 different apps for ordering very supplies. And also when he called in the health line, there's currently a wait time of 13 hours. So the problem came out of a lot of people like Joe. Uh, that is how will we enable better personalized care for people with mild symptoms to virtually provide reliable information for self-care at home. Here comes Recover, an integrated care system which provides self-assessment and caring recommendations for people with mild symptoms to have stay-at-home care. Jill first takes a self-assessment, 
after which Recover provides him with personal life recommendation and a concrete action plans so he knows exactly how to protect himself and family. Furthermore, Recover provides live COVID-19 updates to keep Joe informed and follows up with him to check his symptoms daily. In case the situation gets worse, he will be suggested to reach the nearest available hospital. Joe is also excited to say that Recover provides delivery services from local platforms to keep him safe during isolation. After several days of self-care, Joe felt relieved both physically and uh, psychologically. It is not only Joe's problem. Estimates from COVID-19 statistics in the U.S. shows that at the end of this pandemic, more than 1.4 million people might be infected, among which 1.2 million will show mild symptoms. With over 75% household internet penetration nationwide, recovery will be able to reach to over 0.9 million patients. Our one-stop service covers from self-diagnosis, post-diagnosis instructions, daily check-ins, to medication, food, and PPE delivery with the collaboration with our business partners. All of these can happen very soon, as our goal is not to develop from scratch, but to in integrate with existing resources in the market. A quick implementation of our service alleviates stress from both patients and currently overwhelmed healthcare system. The cover has a relatively easy marketing implementation. Consumers are, are incentivized because Recover would prioritize their need for medication and food if there is suggestions of caring at home. Market entry is secure without intense competition since this app will be the first integrated platform in the market. Our initial investment sources come from governments and business partners who have the motivation for collaboration to alleviate such a social and economic crisis as fast as possible. That being said, thanks for your attention and we welcome any questions. Great, thank you. So I, I have a question. Um, how, how do you understand the, the implementation pipeline and time frame on this one? Uh, in terms of uh, are you talking about the, the, sorry the, the, I guess the speed of sorry let me clarify I apologize speed of deploying this solution how quickly you think you could rapidly develop this prototype so we think we can be rather fast to develop the prototype so the main the main target will be that first we will uh, we will reach out to the business partners that we could integrate with and uh, but the core features of this platform which is like first to provide the carrying and the self assessment tool itself is not very costly because there are a lot of resources and the third party tools out there what we need is just to integrate with them so we think we could just integrate with small amount of official sources first and then we can slowly expand as we progress. And in terms of content, um, as, well, as soon as we can, we are able to like, connect with medical uh, resources to provide more accurate, like the plans and the content or that goes into this application. So as you can see on the timeline, we're sort of uh, hoping to get this uh, uh, roadmap on the end of the month if uh, all those things can have a concurrently. Great, thanks everyone. That's all the time that we have. Um, so next up, we're gonna plan-wise, um, share their screen and present. And after that, we'll have Team SDO. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. In a 2015 TED Talk, Microsoft CEO, Mr. Bill Gates discussed how unprepared we are for the next epidemic. He suggested native war games like strategies for medicine. The, health, the healthcare systems today are burdened not only in handling resource shortages, but they are also dealing with inconsistent guidelines, Oh, I am not able to advance the slide. You should be. It's it's I'm not moving. Or, uh, maybe maybe the Google is not. 
Try clicking an arrow down or over. It's not, uh, not moving at all. Can someone else share the screen? Yeah, I'll do it. Thanks, guys. I paused the time, so we'll restart um, when we are able to reopen it. Can we reset the clock on that? Yeah, I've reset the time. Uh, are we good? Can everyone see the slide deck? There it works. Yeah. Yes. OK. Hey. Um, I will start over again. Thank yeah, you for doing this. Thank you for doing this. In a 2015 TED Talk, Microsoft CEO Mr. Bill Gates discussed how unprepared we are for the next epidemic. He suggested a narrow work group like strategy for medicine. The healthcare systems are burdened. Next slide. The healthcare systems are burdened not only in handling resource shortages, but also dealing with inconsistent guidelines leading to information overload. Today, hospitals are using manual and semi-automated ways to distill the inconsistent guidelines and predicting the south surge and staffing shortages. This process is very reactive rather than proactive, and the status quo is not meeting the bar. Wouldn't it be nice to have a system that can help the hospital administrators to be proactive rather than reactive and be prepared for an epidemic or a natural disaster or better planning within the organization. Introducing PlanWise, a platform where hospital administrators and crisis command teams can run simulation models based on levels of care, such as conventional care, contingency care, and, and crisis care as defined by Institute of Medicine, and run these levels of care against various guidelines to predict the care impact, resource capacity, and economic impact indices, and recommend alternate care strategies. The platform interfaces, next slide. The platform interfaces and integrates with the existing EHR for patient clinical data and data warehouse or analytical solutions that are in place in the health systems for resource utilization data using partner solutions such as InterSystems or Redox uh, interface engine. PlanWise guide, guidance management system will use NLP and AI to, de to derive actionable insights from the guidelines that can be applied over the data to recommend alternate care strategies such as early discharge or transfer, rapid admission process, etc. Next slide. We are first to the market to enable a health system to be proactive and be prepared by running various simulations to perform crisis analysis and deliver actionable insights with optimal care strategies. Next slide. We provide health systems with options to purchase the product and pay the product fee, or an option for remote cloud-based crisis analysis to allow for hands-off operation on crisis management for a service fee, or allow for purchasing both. The future phases exactly. of the product, we can provide the simulation models at a county, state, or federal level. Next slide. We are a diverse team of varied skill sets. Highly trained health IT professionals, data scientists, AI experts, and clinical experts. We are the perfect team ready to tackle this challenge and help our health systems be ready and be wise. Be ready, be wise, plan wise. Great. Um, that minutes for Q&A. Question, what, uh, what is your plan for implementation? How do you the get to market? For, the plan for implementation is a phased approach. The first phase will be tackling the crisis guidelines first, because we are in a crisis situation. That's where the health systems are focused on. And once we reach the crisis guidelines, then we will go to the contingency care guidelines and then move on to the conventional care guidelines. Uh, one question is related to the implementation. Do you have an idea of currently what the bottlenecks in all these processes are? I mean, you're obviously trying to integrate many diverse things. I'm just curious what the, of these, what is the highest priority from uh, hospitals and clinics now? I think the biggest priority right now is distilling this diverse guidelines that are coming from 
various entities like the state departments and the CDC and the federal government. So distilling that guidelines into actionable insights that can drive for alternate care strategies will be the very first step. So it's not the specific hospitals that are getting the data. It's more the government entities that are doing that. The government entities are creating the guidelines like the state departments and the CDC and the Institute of Medicine and the hospitals and the health systems have to follow those guidelines in terms of alternate care strategies, etc. And in order to distill that information, it's taking a lot of manual effort from the health systems. So the health systems will use our tool to help them with distilling that data. All right, thanks guys. That's all the time we have. So up next, we're gonna have Waitlist. Sorry, I got the name wrong um, before, but Waitlist is presenting now. And after that, we'll have Grassroots Troop. Hello? All right, we can see your Awesome. All right, now we'll get started. Waiting rooms suck. Oops. We all know that waiting rooms are awful, but COVID-19 could make them deadly. Today, waiting rooms are a high-risk area for the spread of infectious diseases between patients, and patients are opting out of their appointments. This will lead to long-term issues, specifically complications with untreated conditions and outpatient clinics going out of business. Conditions which are caught early result in better patient outcomes. However, if not diagnosed in a timely manner, there can be serious complications. Clinics face severe financial strain without regular patient traffic, and many clinics have been forced to lay off staff. Without quick action, these practices will be forced to permanently shut down. Some patients will remain fearful of going to their appointments even after the peak of the pandemic has passed. Introducing Waitlist, a unique digital waiting room that functions as a web-based mobile platform and medical software to optimize social distancing. In a nutshell, we remotely check patients into a digital waiting room so they only come to the clinic when their exam room is ready. So how does it work? A patient first receives a text message before their scheduled appointment. They click a link when they are approaching the clinic either by car or foot. There are no apps to download similar to doxy.me. Next, patients are taken to a secure webpage where they check in and share information, such as insurance, with staff just as if they were sitting at the registration. When done, the clinic is notified and the patient can wait wherever they desire. When ready, staff will send another text inviting the patient straight to the exam room, effectively bypassing the wait room. To speed development, Waitlist will use proven technologies that can be rapidly developed. We do not require any integrations or apps to download, and we plan for rapid adoption while we preserve existing workflows. There are currently 47,000 outpatient clinics in the United States, and in the final week of March 2020, some clinics saw a 50% drop in elective surgeries. We project an estimated $64 billion loss in revenue associated with these canceled appointments. Waitlist optimizes social distancing to protect patients and bring them back to the clinic. So let's look at the alternatives. Doxy.me is a telehealth platform which added 140,000 providers last week showing demand for digital health technology that providers are willing to subscribe to. We intend waitlist to follow a similar revenue path. Insurance companies could also be another potential vertical. With added resources, our timed MVP is expected to be four to six weeks, assisted with existing partnerships with RxVat. A pilot will follow at Graves Gilbert Clinic in Kentucky. We are a diverse and talented team spanning nine time zones, and we can't wait. Join us at waitlist. Thank you. Great, thanks. So we have a little bit over two minutes for questions. Uh, great presentation. Uh, one question I had, you mentioned uh, existing partnership that you had as well as already identifying a pilot. Um, just curious what those relationships are like, if this was also this weekend or where that comes from. Yeah, so <clears throat> I, I'm James. I'm a, a dermatologist in Kentucky. And so that's, that's, that's my clinic uh, awesome. where I'm a partner. Uh, and that's also a startup that I, that, I, that I launched out of MIT, Hacking Dermatology, a couple of years ago. And we're focused in the uh, kind of the telepharmacy uh, arena. And we have uh, essentially software that has a lot of the capabilities in terms of text messaging, uh, patient, ma patient management. And we have a, a tech team that we can repurpose in, our, in a rapid way, uh, especially if we could get some additional resources. Uh, we would be able to, I think, really rapidly develop an MVP 
uh, hopefully test it here and then have uh, parallel partners uh, on track uh, that we can uh, launch uh, nationwide. Thank you. Zach, good poll here. Do you have kind of a niche or the first um, patients that you've identified are going to both want to get care when they want to go back in, but at the same time are going to be more hesitant um, because of COVID-19? Yeah, I think the niche is dermatology. Like, honestly, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's a thing where um, patients can have really severe disease. That, that, that picture was that you maybe saw in the, in the presentation of the severe uh, case of melanoma, melanoma on the back is, um, is a patient of mine that I'm very close with. I actually spoke with him this morning to give me per permission to tell his story. And so um, uh, dermatology is a thing where people don't always recognize that it's important to come and see a doctor, but you can have devastating consequences. But I would also expand that to other specialties, for instance, cardiovascular, so cardiology, where it's really hard to, to sometimes screen for things like uh, stable angina, where somebody might have a critical coronary plaque that could rupture and necessarily do, do that over the phone. So my cardiology um, uh, partners are really nervous about what could happen. Are there patients that they might be losing right now? And so they've had to be really aggressive with antiplatelet therapies um, in a way that maybe they normally wouldn't be. Just, just to, and I think we're all kind of spitballing things, honestly, from, from a medicine side. Sure. All right, thank uh, you, guys, with all the time we have. Though? Oh, sorry. If you want to ask one more question, we can do maybe one more question. I, I, the, the, the last bit actually confused me. So are you guys like, oh, initially, it sounded like you guys were a, a workflow thing, right? Like, yeah. total sense. Are you also a treatment tool as well? Or like Not a treatment tool. No, it's just a workflow. It, it. It's, okay. it's independent, no integrations. And got it's it. just a way to, to, exactly. So you got it. Got it. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks, everyone. So up next, we'll have a grassroots troop. If you guys can share your slides. And then after that, we'll have Get Care. Hi, can you hear me and or see my, my video? I can hear you. Um, I don't quite see a video yet. Just see your desktop. desktop. All right. Um, share. So I've tried it twice already. No? Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's there. All right. <clears throat> Okay, so hi everyone, excited to be here. My name is Alice Fang and we're the Grassroots Troop. Um, yeah. um, the product we developed over the weekend is called the Food Locker, which aims to dispense better nutrition to lower income communities, one meal at a time. COVID-19 has exacerbated the issue of food insecurity in lower income communities. The country has already had 37 million food insecure population in 2018, and we've seen a 6.4 million jump in unemployment as of mid-March. During the Great Recession in 2008, food insecure population increased by almost 15%. So with food banks lacking volunteers at, or even shutting down, we must act now to blunt the impact on vulnerable population by providing easy access to nutritious food. To address this, we are going to be implementing vending machines adapted to provide educational videos, recipes, and dispense individual food portions to those seeking assistance. They can also receive a printout of additional information or have it sent to their home or phone. So the way that this will work is to first collect food from donors such as the general public and leftover community share goods and sponsoring suppliers then distribute and stock machines and store it in these vending machines in the form of fresh food and also meals prepared by local restaurants, uh, which are now affected during the COVID crisis. Lastly, we will provide access to the machine to those in need through a QR code that can be obtained from food shelters or customers can also pay full price to sponsor this effort. Um, and this will contribute to the funding of the program. 
So the business model is comprised of a revenue stream that includes direct purchases, 80% of which are reserved for those in need through these QR codes and 20% from the full price sponsors, as well as donors and advertising. The general costs incurred are transportation of the food, restocking and maintenance fees. Examples of the food provided are listed below. So these foods are relatively low cost to procure, but have high nutritional value and can be pre prepared quickly. Simple recipes will be provided for customers that can be printed out or sent to, look to their mobile device if they have one, uh, to keep the recipe or to share with friends and family. The screens will provide recipe demos that will be recorded um, with local Russian owners, which will help them gain exposure within the community. So most importantly, these machines will have information that will be provided to customers, which will lead them uh, to local resources for health-related services within their community. These videos will be required to watch before the food is retrieved from the vending machine and will uh, contain timely health information such as related to COVID-19, such as washing hands, when to come in for symptoms, etc. In the future, other information related to ailments that these populations usually face will be provided. And we will recruit community leaders to be in these videos to build trust between our service and the customer. This information will also be made available by printing or uh, by printing this information out or having it sent out. Okay. By, implement by implementing our solution, we will provide 24-hour uh, access to food and provide relevant health and shelter information to encourage users to visit appropriate health providers to reduce unnecessary ER visits. So with that, thank you for your attention and we'll take questions. Thank you for the uh, presentation, guys. A um, couple of questions. One, um, you're obviously creating sort of like a hotspot for people to go to. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on how to maintain that sanitary and two, where will you put these? Sure, so I can actually take that, uh, that question. My name is Joshua and I'm part of the, the team. Um, regarding the sanitation, uh, we thought that that would come up, of course, and we had planned on using UV, um, UV lights to disinfect a touchpad um, screen that the users would be using. Um, and regarding locations, uh, we would be targeting one, uh, one metropolitan area within the United States, um, either New York or Philadelphia, most likely, and uh, using um, uh, essentially um, like census data to identify low, low SES communities, um, typically identified as below 133% of the five. More, more specifically, I mean, not location in terms of just geographic, but where, like on the street, in, in a specific shop, like wh wh where would you put these? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so again, going on with the, uh, with the so we, we, we've considered vandalism um, uh, specifically, right? So mobbing the machine and trying to get out too much of the, the, the product. So we considered uh, contracting with community centers, um, uh, shelters or other locations where they may, may be in high need, but in t inside of a building. You guys should Maybe be uh, partners. Have you guys spoke to any of these potential collaborators? Um, and if so, what were yeah. some of the outcomes of those yeah. conversations? No, unfortunately, we have not been able to reach out to <laughs> any of our uh, potential partners this weekend. Um, though we have uh, certainly sunk a lot of time into figuring out machines and sourcing um, and where those could potentially um, be sourced from. All right, thanks everybody. That's all the time we have. Thank you so much. Um, so up next we have Get Care. So you guys can share your screen and then we have Day to Day after that. Can you guys see this? Yes, we can see it. You can start. Good, Andre. Okay, awesome. Um, thank you very much for listening to our pitch. We're really excited to share our idea for Care at Home, a service that matches up patients and doctors displaced by COVID-19 to provide care for minor conditions, backed up by both a set of safety protocols and a digital platform. So the problem we're trying to tackle is the cancellation and postponement of minor but important health interventions for many patients due to COVID-19. Uh, meanwhile, many healthcare professionals with valuable skills are no longer able to work, either due to formal furloughs at their place of business or to general social distancing to prevent further spread of the virus. As part of our research, we spoke to Margo, an 81-year-old grandmother of one of our team members who has wet age-related macular degeneration and in non-COVID times goes to a hospital to get her monthly injection without which she can go blind. 
We also spoke to Paul, who is an ophthalmologist who normally works at a large private hospital, but is currently not working because the hospital is focused on reducing the spread of COVID-19. So why can't we match up these two people to provide at-home care? My colleague, Lawrence, will walk you through exactly how we can do just that. Great, so this is how it works. Uh, a patient and healthcare professional are onboarded onto the platform, which then provides appropriate matching based on needs and location. Uh, the solution offers guidance on providing safe care and care is delivered by the healthcare professional. Care at Home enables care to be delivered in a safe setting following COVID-19 guidelines. A vetting and matching process ensures appropriate care based on needs as well as safety. A digital platform supports onboarding and knowledge sharing. And the solution is embedded into the existing health system supporting current insurance and provider structures. Within the spectrum of care, from telemedicine to acute, uh, the solution plugs the gap by expanding what is possible in home care. A primary component of the safe setting is a set of dedicated protocols established to ensure COVID-19 protection and successful care. These protocols are based on the COVID-19 status of the patient and healthcare professional, as well as the procedure required. Today, complex procedures are increasingly possible outside of the hospital environment. And our solution will help support the future of at-home care with strong protocols, training, and tools. We will launch Care at Home in three phases. The first phase will be a narrow pilot, working with challenge partners such as UHS. In the second phase, we will expand to more complex care for broader risk populations uh, and, build, and build additional tools to support a wider range of cases. The third phase will be a broader expansion of our partner network and to new geographies, enabling millions to receive essential care, thousands of healthcare professionals to work at capacity and support the longer term shift from ambulatory to home care. We're confident in our diverse team, coupled with the expertise and reach of partners such as UHS, uh, plug and play, folks like Infinite MD, and we are well positioned to bring care at home forward and support the future of care in a COVID-19 world. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions? Um, is this uh, in, in primary care? Is this, is, have you guys thought about sort of what, which, which segment of care, caring for people at home? Yep. Yep. So uh, we, we, we would first uh, focus on a narrow set of uh, procedures and types of care, um, probably starting with ones that are less invasive to ensure that uh, we have the right protocols uh, and model in place and eventually scale up to uh, other types of care, including diagnostics and perhaps even more invasive procedures. Um, but we would start with ones that are a little bit safer, less invasive, uh, but that folks still really want in, in current situations, um, and then grow from there. Got it. All right, any other questions? Um, uh, did you guys comment a little bit more on the business model? Absolutely. So we think that, um, hello, by the way, this is Calypso. We think that initially we'd target a fee-for-service model just to um, gain buy-in and because it's the most straightforward approach. But depending on the insurers that we partner with and their the extent of their shift towards population health and more integrated models, we could envisage a, uh, a more population-based payment model rather than a per-episode payment. Last question, I've got thought about how this is maybe different from like the teledocs and the MD lives and like the AMWELLs of the world. Uh, could you could you let us know a little bit about more about those or those more telemedicine? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, they are uh, established companies that do a lot of these sort of remote visits um, and uh, you know, like teledoc, teledoc is large. Um, all these companies are quite large. I was wondering if you had seen those solutions and how this, what's your competitive advantage against some of these? So I would say that the competitive advantage is twofold. First of all, we are actively 
trying to bridge the gap between the patients who do need the procedures and the fact that there's a part of the workforce that's currently on hold. So that would be the benefit of the platform uh, in using under capacity healthcare. And then there's also the fact that we would really be thinking about the COVID situation, but the post COVID time as well, where um, we'd have some safety protocols that apply to patients who are, who are naive and, and healthcare providers who are naive as well, but also limiting the safety protocols in a setting where both the healthcare professional and the patient has recovered. So that way we, we try to be a little bit more efficient. All right, thanks guys. That's all the time we have. So. Uh... Um, up next, we'll have day today. So if you guys can share your slides. And then after that, we'll have tele, Telex Health. Cool. Uh, hi, this is Day to Day Aditi from Day to Day Health here. Can everyone see my slide? Yes, we can see it. Cool. Uh, just a second. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Can, sorry, someone mute the uh, microphone. <laughs> Um, okay, cool. So when we really think about uh, new ways of delivering care, there are really three stakeholders that we want to uh, solve, uh, uh, you know, the respective problems uh, uh, for. So hospitals who are you know, essentially capacity constrained to not having a centralized tool for triaging patients, educating them, even though they might have personnel available for it to clinicians who essentially are the most vulnerable um, a, a group of people uh, uh, to, to, the, to the infection, to patients who, for the lack of a better word, are essentially lost uh, through the process of isolation and quarantine. So if we have to think about uh, solving these individual problems, I think we need to think, think, uh, take a really a bit of a systems approach and, and, and think holistically about it. And when, we do, and when we did that, there were two key goals that we thought about. One is how do we really essentially maximize healthcare worker availability uh, to not only free up capacity, but also uh, in, increase availability by reducing their exposure to, um, to the disease. And secondly, how can we consistently ensure patient engagement and education during such a stressful time for them? And towards that, we are presenting a digital first care management program that allows patients who are at low to moderate risk uh, so essentially 80% uh, of the patients, which is majority of the COVID-19 patients, to be able to manage effectively and safely from home. And that typically, that there are four components to that, to that uh, solution. Symptom management uh, essentially means identifying patients, um, you know, that have newer escalated symptoms through tracking, you know, vital signs and triaging uh, so that they get the right medical intervention. Uh, the second piece is around engaging education, which is basically providing practical guidelines to understand the disease better, to avoid having neg negative thoughts, fire a lot of control. Psycho mental well-being is as important as physical well-being uh, in, in, for, in, in COVID. And you know, the app would provide uh, stress reduction tips, reduction tips and relaxation activities and streamlined communication. So being able to, for patients to be able to easily chat with, with uh, clinicians um, as and when it's needed. And in terms of what that workflow would, would look like, so when we go to implementation partners, you have patients that reach out to, that are prospective patients or patients who are uh, high risk patients, but stable enough to be discharged. Their PCP registered them through our clinician dashboard onto the program. They get, a, they get a link to download the app with the program and then they're able to use it and the clinicians can track them back on the dashboard. And this is what the clinician dashboard might look like. So you can actually track different uh, uh, symptoms and vitals on a daily basis for a patient. And we really think we, you know, this is something that we can do and implement right away because we've already done that as a company. We are an acute care management company. And you know, we bring a whole lot of expertise to bear for that, uh, whether it's clinical, whether it's uh, technical. Our products are highly adaptable and easily scalable. And uh, the most important thing is they can be updated as we get more and more emerging data about COVID. And with that, um, we are happy to take more questions um, that you may have. Thanks. All right, we got about a minute and a half for questions. Hi, Zach Paul here. How are you going to be um, actually tracking the vitals? Yeah, so, so most of the vitals, so it, 
so when we look at, if you look at the, sorry, let me just go back to the vital screen. So a lot of the vitals, let's say heart rate, uh, temperature, et cetera, respir respiratory rate is, um, you know, you can usually track that at home and the app, app will have tutorials around, around that to do that. For things like blood pressure or SpO2, that's mostly applic applicable to patients that have a certain level of comorbidities or that have certain conditions like you know, respiratory disease, et cetera. Uh, um, uh, based on what data we saw, that they typically would have, let's say, a blood pressure gauge uh, uh, or, or a pulse ox to do that. But for the most part, to track the symptoms, I think there, uh, you know, uh, temperature as, uh, and respiratory, respiratory rate would be the more critical uh, vitals to track. And that's something that we can easily do that. You don't need any device for that. Great, okay. And then do you have data that these are the most important vitals to be tracking? Or is there any other vitals that would be really important for you to be tracking as well? So, so, the, way we, so we, the way we put together, you know, put together these vitals was based on looking at what existing, clinic, what existing clinical information has been published by you know, organizations like the WHO and CDC. And these seem to be the more important ones. Uh, for COVID-19 patients, and uh, uh, you know, as and if you know, if you go, let's say, you know, go to any of our in clinical partners to implement this, based on what their needs are, this could be updated, and we can think about how we can uh, incorporate that workflow into the application and the dashboard. That's totally uh, that's that's fairly customizable. All right, thanks, Thank guys. That's all the time we have. Um, so up next. We have Telex Health, and then after that, we'll have Hunger Free COVID. Hi, guys. Um, can you see the screen? We can see the screen. Yeah, cool. Uh, hi, everyone. We are Telex Health, and we are here to provide you an alternative way how to provide telehealth access to households that don't have high speed internet at home. It's a huge problem in US alone. There are 20 million people that don't have access to high-speed internet. Uh, it won't come as a surprise that 75% of those live in rural areas and most of them come from low-income household. Uh, the medical community and the government, even before the crisis, were trying to solve this uh, themselves. But what got worse uh, is the situation during the COVID crisis. Because people like Sarah, who is a single mother who lives in rural area in Houston, she used to go to the library to get the access to high-speed internet and access her tele, uh, telehealth provider, but now she can't. And as she's experiencing a major back pain and she cannot really cater for her daughter because you know she's alone and her family is not there, so she's actually considering driving 50 miles to the nearest hospital to get uh, a check and support but obviously you know nobody's waiting her in this hospital and she probably will not get the care she needs so how can we help sarah so what we suggest is uh, with our solution to connect her to a volunteer in her community that will deliver an ipad with high speed mobile data to her house so she can actually have this treatment and access to telehealth services at home so how it actually work, uh, she would log into our website, she would book an appointment for the telehealth services uh, that fits her, provide the details and address where she lives, any kind of additional comments. And then we will match her the, with a volunteer in her community who will bring this iPad to her so she can take this appointment and then take it back to a, a, another member who needs it in that same community. Why we believe the solution will, can be launched quite quickly is because the three key stakeholders in this ecosystem are already mobilized. First of all, we have telehealth uh, providers. They just got, uh, the, the law just authorized half a billion in funding to help those telehealth services to increase their demographic spread. Uh, so they, they have you know, the, the financial support they need to provide it. Then we have the uh, mobile operators that are already forced by FCC to continue provide the connectivity. Sorry? 20 seconds. 
Um, and then we have the most importantly volunteers and we've seen this insane outpour of support in every country and the same like we are doing now with this hackathon. And we are a team of experts and supported by the advisor that believe can bring the solution to the market and deliver even more. And as a final uh, point, we already have Australian telehealth providers interested in this solution. So this solution is jurisdiction. Um, 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 <laughs> it can be applied to any jurisdiction, either it's public health or private health. Thank you. Great, any questions? Can you, can you expand on operationalizing this, um, you mentioned the iPad with the high uh, speed internet that would be, you know, the volunteer and then you'd pair them with that volunteer to be able to execute. But can you say more about operationalizing this solution? Sure. So um, when you say operationalize, do you mean how this will interface with telehealth providers? So what exactly is going on to get all this information in the right place? Or do you want me to walk you through the entire like management pathway? Just a high level uh, uh, workflow, if you don't mind. Just the throughput uh, high level. Okay, so at a high level, um, this iPad will be delivered to someone's house, but the first step is they've reached our platform and on the web, and the patient uh, provides the information that they need to give to the health telehealth provider. We basically streamline this entire reporting process of what type of appointment they want to book with what type of provider, and then this gets fed back into uh, the telehealth partners we potentially will have. This will all be a security process. Um, data security is really, really important to us and we have some plans with that. And then these providers would you know, agree on a date to actually have this occur. And then what we do is we have this fleet of volunteers that will bring the iPads to these individuals at the time that they need to make this appointment. And with that, they bring this high-speed internet access that is provided by our mobile um, service provider partners that we're planning on. Uh, we have another strategy for that too. Um, so pretty much we bring mobile, high-speed mobile data access and hardware to people that don't have that internet access through their broadband, um, like land connections. All right, I'll leave it open. Maybe one more follow-up question. Um, can you guys also comment a little bit more on the, on the business model? Um, is this like, you know, how, how are you reimbursed for these visits? Um, you know, what are your thoughts around how you, how you scale from the business side? Of course. So we actually aren't considering becoming a business. We're currently partnered with an NGO called a volunteer, uh, Pandemic Volunteers. And right now, we aren't trying to capitalize on this. We're just trying to provide a service. And right now, I think that that's the, honestly the best way to expand our reach. So uh, we don't need to worry about the reimbursement. This is all covered in the U.S. already by a lot of really, really progressive laws that um, really, really, usually telehealth is like a little bit less profitable for providers. But now the U.S. is like reimbursing these telehealth providers. And um, with these like really progressive pushes, we hope to mobilize this volunteer workforce to help expand this increase in supply of telehealth care to this increase in demand. We're just an intermediary. Great. Thanks. Thanks all. Um, that's all the time we have. So our next team is Hunger Free COVID. So if you guys can share your slides and then after that we have Team Immunocovpromised. I hope I pronounced that okay. <laughs> Hunger free COVID. Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Can you right. share your screen? It's just a moment here. Should I be sharing my screen? Yeah, I'm just gonna other team members have it up. Feel free to share your screen, and they can flip for you. Yeah, or we I'm can just pull it up if nobody can get it up. We have a link to your presentation. And for the the next team, when I announce the next team after, if you guys could just take that time to prepare your slides to be ready to to share. 
Um, so next is uh, immunocompromised. So if you guys can prepare your slides um, for after this presentation. Hunger free, do you guys want me to present or do you guys have it? With screen sharing, is it under the video option? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should be kind of in the middle on the bottom. Oh, okay, got it. Um... <sighs> you got it. the slides right now? Yes, we can see them. Okay. Um, and when, when should I start? Right now. Okay. So we are hunger free COVID. So to start, we wanted to highlight the existing disparities. So unemployment in 2018 was at 37 million nationally and food insecure households made up 11.1% of the US population. California additionally experienced one of the highest rates of homelessness. Five trends may seem unrelated. Findings from Feeding America based on USDA data show a tight relationship between food insecurity, SNAP nutrition, supplement programs, poverty, and unemployment. With COVID-19, we see a sharp spike in Americans filing for unemployment, and this puts increased strain on shelters as newly food insecure populations who are unable to put on, or who are unable to be put on food assistance programs or flocking to shelters to meet their nutritional needs. We want to introduce two entities addressing food insecurity. First, Darcy is an AI assistant that can help in people identify local resources to meet their needs, such as, such as food and shelter. Next, Shelter Share currently connects donors with local sh shelters to help stock the inventories of these shelters. However, given the COVID-19 has, has resulted in heightened food insecurities, it is imperative that Darcy's algorithm factors in current inventory resources at shelters to make the most up-to-date up recommendations. With this question in mind, we aim to use Agolia to bridge the inventory data collected by ShelterShare to, to Darcy in order to improve the recommendations provided to the consumer. Darcy is a service orchestration engine powered by AI and modeled index search services. We allow the user to get up-to-date information on social services using geolocation. The customer can then find the closest food station near them. We are partnering with ShelterShare and in collecting their data for customers who need the food assistance immediately. So yes, and ShelterShare will collect weekly inventory data from each shelter and submit this data to the API Algolia. Algolia informs Darcy of shelters that have food available. Darcy can recommend well-stocked shelters to people searching for food resources. And food scarcity is not a site-specific issue. ShelterShare and Darcy are both in California, and we need to connect with reputable stakeholders who can help us scale up our endeavors across the country. This is done by getting buy-in from medical centers and social work institutions to recommend the uses of the Darcy ShelterShare pipeline to their clientele experiencing food insecurity. Another strategy would be to acquire corporate partnerships to leverage existing employee resource groups to provide support in terms of recommending the Darcy ShelterShare pipeline to employees in need of services, leveraging ERG, that was time, Le leveraged, leveraging ERGs, existing relationships with their local shelters to connect them with the pipeline and encouraging employees to donate to shelter shares e-commerce domain to aid supply inventory to local shelters via corporate ERG sponsorship initiative programs. And here's our team and we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Great, thanks guys. Uh, one question that I had is on the current workflows of these shelters. How often do they currently assess and uh, inventory and do they have to report it at any frequency? So that would be a question for me. ShelterShare currently gets this information from the shelters we work at, work with in Los Angeles. Um, this is just a, a kind of a relationship thing that we have where we, we take into account what they need and we post that on our, our website and try to get those, uh, 
those supplies. Um, and when you say when you say currently, does that the shelter share operate in LA, and now you're sort of um, doing the expansion towards SF? Well, uh, no. Yeah. Well, this is the thing is so Darcy also is uh, we also do uh, web. Uh, we have volunteers that web scrape um, that information uh, of the shelters. And then we're using shelter uh, share to um, reach out to those shelters to see how those inventories um, can be replenished. So we're going through the process of making sure that um, I have all this, the um, information is up to date because of COVID, a lot of shelters have had to change the way that they distribute those, those, um, those services. So we are working hand in hand with the shelters, shelter share um, to give the most up to date uh, information to customers. Got it. I mean, just to, just to clarify, is, are you guys operating already or is this mostly sort of you're saying it as in you would like to do this? Yes. Uh, yes. We'd use Algolia as our, as you know, the API, which we're, we're, we would collect the data from ShelterShare's end, uh, communicate that through the API and let Darcy know. Uh, and then anyone calling in to Darcy who's looking for food support will then know if a shelter's, uh, you know, low on, on stock and, and if they should go to that, that shelter or not. And to right now, ShelterShare is still like currently operating. The goal is to use their already established community partnerships and expand it more and adapt their model elsewhere. Right. And a lot of that factors um, that that comes into scaling it to other areas in need is by coupling it with what Darcy offers, so it can be like systematically implemented elsewhere. Right, and as of, as of a week ago, we've uh, partnered with uh, three major uh, uh, food banks, uh, Care Org, uh, Hunger Free America, and No Kids Hungry. So we are um, giving, are going to get their data as well for uh, also those locations. Um, so that way we can have a more up-to-date um, nationwide. Um, uh, so it's right now we're currently in, in, in the California area, but we are expanding nationwide now. All right, thanks guys. That's all the time we have. Um, up next, we have team uh, Immuno Cove Premise. So if you guys can share your screen. Um, and after that, we'll have team triage. So um, team triage, please prepare your slides to be shared next. Great, can everybody see this first slide? Yes, so you can start whenever you're ready. All right, everyone ready? Cool. There are two key groups in the United States. For 40% of Americans who are at high risk for COVID, it's not just about infections. Accessing basic necessities like food becomes a life and death gamble. These people need help. Meanwhile, the rest of us uh, aren't doing too well either. Anxiety has doubled in the United States and is among the highest levels ever. To improve their mental health, these people can volunteer. They are helpers. And so today there's this two-party problem where high-risk people need to perform their daily activities and get necessities safely. Well, there's also a huge population feeling stressed and seeking a sense of purpose and care. So with this unique problem, we want to frame our pitch around having the largest public health impact we can in a rapid rapidly deployable manner. And thus we present what's next, a multi-platform system that can effectively connect helpers with the high-risk individuals to aid in daily activities that currently begins with Nextdoor. Nextdoor is an existing app in 90% of neighborhoods that creates a hub for exchange of helpful information, goods, and services among neighbors. We will be matching neighbors who are offering their help with individuals like the high risk who need help. We have created a wireframe of the app. This first screenshot shows a perspective from a volunteer who is help offering their help. They are able to select specific activities such as groceries, transportation, and healthcare outreach that they can help with as well as the times that they are available. Next, we see that high-risk people can submit a need to their neighbor, including a category, day and time, and any additional information. This request is then added to a prioritized neighborhood queue where it will be matched with the helper. Think of this like the way Uber matches riders with drivers. And finally, helpers receive requests through push notifications and can accept and reject based on their availability. Because our solution integrates quickly, we can reduce the all-time high anxiety levels, which are second only to the Great Depression, by giving a sense of purpose to helpers. We can also decrease infection rates by reducing the number of people in public doing shopping. Finally, we can create infrastructure for sustainable extensions beyond COVID-19. We look to Nextdoor to begin the fastest execution of our tool. As for how we help them, we increase their user base through targeted marketing, giving higher community engagement, while we expand functionality on their site. 
And from them, we're looking to use their user base and their coding teams to implement our fast launch version. To reiterate, this fast launch is all about making the largest public health impact as soon as possible. But to stay sustainable, we aim to extend our matching services through becoming a host for sponsorships, a base for ads, and a central hub for e-commerce businesses. 30 we seconds. Also, we can also mobilize social media by using Facebook profile frames and even TikTok ads to encourage younger demographics to join and implement other marketing strategies such as leveraging doctor recommendations and even national media sponsors to increase use across all demographics. Finally, we are a diverse group from Stanford with strong experiences ranging from engineering and healthcare to consulting. And with your help, we can protect everyone in our community. So what's next? You're next. Any questions? Yeah, great presentation, guys. Have you guys given any thought into where you would want to deploy this first? Um, what a, what's like the initial sort of pilot going to look like? Absolutely. So um, our first step is to create a minimum viable product that doesn't actually require Nextdoor, and that can be deployed, deployed in, a, um, in a couple of days. Um, so we'll select a couple of Nextdoor communities to pilot in by creating a post in their neighborhoods, and then using this to gather user research and user information about how to expand the product. Do you have any data on how many volunteers you expect um, to be able to sign up um, and then also how um, active they'll be? So we're already seeing that uh, people are posting on Nextdoor. This is just like uh, general information that we've observed um, helping other neighbors and there's lots of news stories in the media. I don't have any exact numbers for the number of people, but Nextdoor is in about 90% of neighborhoods and it seems like there's a few people in each neighborhood already stepping up to help. Is, is Nextdoor at all, um, is there propriety at all, or you, is there any constraints with leveraging or, or utilizing them? Um, I believe if we partner with them, there should not be. Uh, but this is okay. just a service that the minimum viable product would just be advertised through Nextdoor, and there's no issue with that. Okay. Um, building on those, just to maybe a clarif clarification. Um, so what exactly are the net services that you guys would like to provide that Nextdoor does not? So Nextdoor currently is mostly a, like a hub, a social media hub for uh, people to request help or to request services. This is basically an additional um, piece of that that would be matching people in a community to make sure that it's efficiently making sure that everyone who needs help gets help. Got it. Great. Thanks everyone, that's all the time that we have. Um, up next, we have team triage. And after that, we'll have hack COVID. So team triage, please share your screen now and hack COVID, um, prepare your slides to share them next. Do you see our screen and hear me? Yes, we can see your screen and hear me. Okay. For years, minority communities have been forgotten by the healthcare institution, and it's no different during this COVID pandemic. Communities of color that can't speak English are unable to access much needed care to help them stay healthy during this crisis. Take Maria, for instance, an elderly Hispanic woman. She's one of the 65 million people in our country that can't speak English, and she's worried that she has COVID-19 and rushes to the overcrowded ER where language is a huge barrier. John, an English-speaking ER doctor, is overwhelmed with his ever-increasing patient load, and the hospital's triage team identifies Maria as only medium priority. So she's sent back home and has put her life in danger for what seems like nothing. We have the answer. We present Triage Connect, an innovative process tool that streamlines the typical EMS triage workflow on a multi-language platform, serving to the diverse needs of overwhelmed healthcare systems and patients like Maria. The three main aspects to our solution include a method for at-home triaging with a multilinguistic interface, an emphasis on multilinguistic access to education and telemedicine, and the direct flow of information from at-home triage to the patient provider encounter. Our product flow begins with the user specifying their preferred language. The translated survey will ask questions about symptoms, pre-existing conditions, and potential exposures to COVID, and will place the patient into one of four triage categories. The user can then consult an online healthcare pro provider or an ER physician can directly access the user's data through patient-specific IDs. 
our solution aims to fight the virus by first decreasing on-site disease transmission using at-home triaging. The decrease in the number of in-person patients lowers the load on the ER system, while the multilinguistic user interface bridges the language barrier that stands between providers and possible COVID-19 patients. We can already see a huge potential market for our product with over 5,000 hospitals and more than 65 million U.S. residents who don't speak English, which open a huge opportunity for our product to streamline. These hospital ERs can face median wait times ranging up to two hours. And of these patients that come through these ERs annually, more than 8 million have only limited English proficiency. Our triage solution can make a difference for these overburdened hospitals and underserved patient populations. Our business model will be a combination of licensing a customizable option to hospital networks with an existing patient base and charging telehealth companies an initial subscription and fixed fee referrals beyond the initial quota. Assuming 10 to 15% market share, this will result in annual revenues of approximately 13.44 million. We will pursue hospital groups and telehealth companies through direct sales. In addition, we will work with insurance companies and public health agencies as our partners to capitalize on their networks of healthcare providers and community advocates in order to increase adoption. Our team's wide expertise in medicine, technology, leadership, and business development highlights our unique ability to effectively implement the solution. Triage Connect is the solution we need to deliver effective care in this crisis, acting as a pioneer for the future of healthcare. We're looking for a hospital to beta test with, so we'd appreciate any leads as well. Thank you so much for your time. Questions? Um, a lot of uh, great presentation, guys. A lot of big companies are moving in this space, um, you know, like yeah. Microsoft, Apple. Um, they all kind of launched their own triage chatbots, and there's, you know, maybe a dozen other companies that are exploring something similar. How do you guys differ from these other solutions? So um, one main part of our product that's like a differentiation, differentiating factor is the multilingual base. So the fact that we have um, Amazon, like we're planning on using different softwares, like it's such as Amazon Translate and Amazon Medical Comprehend, that'll be able to um, translate data, real, translate data from the um, from the actual platform to the database and then back to the platform, so that it's an easy communication between the providers, the technology, and the users. And what the purpose of this is so that um, it really slows, it really increases the availability of healthcare providers that are currently spending time at the ERs, um, like triaging real time. And this way it slows down both infection rates for unnecessary, unnecessary ER visits, and it increases the availability of doctors and healthcare providers who are available for real COVID and non-COVID cases. I want to go off of Chris's question. Why won't the bigger players, like why can't they just implement um, other languages into the platform? Why, why is your solution something they need that they can't build? I think one of the major things that uh, sets us apart is that the fact that we already have a uh, working sample UI that's um, still being uh, developed, but still working right now. And we're at the forefront of this technology right now. So although more competitors might enter the field at a later time, for this COVID pandemic, we're the only ones right now that are uh, doing uh, this triage uh, streamlining in a multilingual interface, which is effectively um, reducing the amount of on-site disease transmission and connecting pac uh, patient to provider right away. All right, thanks everyone. That's all the time that we have. Uh, up next, we're gonna have uh, the Hack COVID team present. So you guys can share your slides. And then after that, we have Hello Buddy. Do we have somebody from Hack COVID that's going to um, share their screen? I'm into their deck. Is anybody from Hot COVID here? Check their channel.
All right, I'm posting in their channel, but if they don't respond in like 30 seconds, I think we just go to the next team. All right, that next team is Hello Buddy. So if you guys can just prep your slides in the meantime. Yep. Thank you. Victor Serum. Either of them here. I'm just messaging them individually as well. All right, I think we go on to Hello Buddy. They're not online or responsive. Uh, we can go if. Yeah, let's okay. keep it rolling. All right. And then, uh, so yeah, and then after hello, we'll have diagnostic homey. So you okay. guys can uh, prepare your screens, uh, your slides for after this next presentation. All right, uh, the, the presentation. You can start whenever you're ready. All right, hi, so we are team Hello Buddy. We are a cool discharge tool. Our solution looks at uh, monitoring the patient's health after the discharge, in particular the COVID-19. So why is it a big deal at the moment? Well, right now it's predicted that 90 million uh, are expected to be affected. And out of which right now 150K are in the tri-state, out of which 27,000 are admitted. And the last thing that we want is readmission of these patients due to uh, improper ch uh, chair, uh, checkup and care. So at this point, we are looking at the value proposition of A, reducing the hospital load by identifying the early disease progression by just using the basic symptoms that we have been uh, discovering in our talks with the doctors during the weekend, which was uh, vomit, oxygen level, breathing, temperature, and hydration status. The second thing that we want to look to do is extend the healthcare team by involving the family members and also to have a humanistic follow-up, which will help reduce the anxiety in the patients and ensure that they feel that they're recovering. So the idea here is that at this point of time, patients get admitted, they get treated and discharged and they have a follow-up checkup. But due to the uh, overload in the system, right now that particular piece of follow-up checkup is not happening. And we are looking to bring in Hello Buddy just before the patient gets discharged. And this is where our intervention point is. It's a 21 day checkup support program looking at the physical and the mental health. And this is how it will look, a mobile app, which is a little gamified. It has the feeling of act actually talking to a person. The language follows that. And the idea is to keep uh, have a regular constant check. And this will be regulated by a chatbot. On the side of the family, we are looking in case the medication is missed or the person forgets to put in that they have taken the medication, we will have the family notified and they will either be prompted to text, call, or just check up. And the incentives here for the health organization are broken down into three parts. One, which is to prevent readmission uh, and, uh, and ensure that there is no uh, and ensure that there is no overload due to that. The second thing we're looking at is earlier intervention. And this is just checking the basic uh, vitals of the patient after the release uh, so that the deterioration level is known much before rather than after. And also the, pati the patient discharge experience is better. Uh, in terms of revenue stream, we are looking at creating data, this data points as a, uh, as a data bank as, you, as this currently is a novel disease and it will be very valuable. In terms of our team, we have a team of designers, health uh, and medics, and as well as a person who is uh, very experienced in health portfolio startups. Thank you. So I have a question. Uh, thank you for, for the presentation. Um, oh, God, I forgot my question. Somebody else go. <laughs> Just forgot it.
I'll go. Um, this is Zachary Pohl. Question, how do you guys see yourselves as different than all of the other companies trying to do um, treatment plans once they're discharged from the hospital? So I could answer that. I'm, I'm young. Um, and yeah. so I think the primary difference is the level of engagement that we have. So most companies right now, most plans, it's kind of a list and um, it's not a real dialogue. And the level of engagement, I think, that we're having a conversation and dialogue with both the patient and who we're enlisting as a member of this new healthcare team now, um, that's going to be what really proves us to be successful compared to other companies. Um, you know, we've, we've had discharge plans where it really is just a list and this is a printout for you and this is a printout for um, you know, your family member. Um, I think the second thing is by having this dialogue, we're, we're really changing the paradigm of who the healthcare team members are. Right now, part of the healthcare providers, you know, in this particular time, uh, we're pulling retirees, we're pulling med students, um, you know, this is, it's, we're trying to find anyone we can. We're not looking at the community as a true healthcare team member. We're looking at them as kind of a helper um, to kind of follow up at certain checkpoints. Um, this is giving them not only the, excuse me, not only the patient, but um, the community healthcare team member, the tools to act, actually be a part of that healthcare team. Um, it's, 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 uh, I think the level of involvement and the dialogue is just a lot higher from that. Um, I'm sorry, the second thing, I'm oh, sorry, the second thing um, real quick is we're not aiming to be a medical assessment company. Uh, this is like an early warning system for a discharge patient. Um, so, you know, we're, we're getting very global types of measures. Um, so I think uh, also uh, that makes us immune to all these changes in regulations and in terms of telehealth companies. Um, they're relaxed right now, uh, but once this pandemic passes, these regulations will come back. Uh, we're not aiming to be a true telehealth company. All right, we probably have time for maybe one more question. So my, my question is just, you know, who, who's paying for this? Um, how do you understand it to be monetized? Yeah, so I think um, we briefly touched on one part of it, which is the monetization of data. Um, and, you know, in this immediate time period, uh, we're in a data-free zone um, just by nature of the fact that we don't know much about COVID-19. Um, uh, and, um, you know, I think all this collection of data over there, it'll be, it'll be very useful. Um, we don't necessarily have to monetize it. Um, but, you know, it, it's going to be useful for people. And then this is really not a medical data, but this is also a lot of social data. So there's a lot of focus on social determinants of health and, you know, your community and how you interact. And I think that that type of data, too, will be very useful. Um, from the hospital standpoint, I think it's a no brainer. Uh, this is uh, you're expanding your healthcare provider pool um, almost immediately at almost zero cost. Um, there's about half a billion dollars per year in HCAP penalties um, for readmissions after discharge. And I think that, um, you know, paying either a subscription or a per patient service fee for this is a drop in the bucket and it has the potential to make huge impacts in that. All right, that's all the time we have. Thanks so much. Um, up next, we have Diagnostic Homey. You guys can share your screen. And after that, we have We Can Sue It. So you guys, we can see it. Please prepare your slides for after this presentation. Hello. Hello. Can you see slides? Yeah, yeah. we can see slides. Okay, I'm starting. Hi, I'm Drishti. We are Diagnostic Homey. We are here to identify patients who are at the high risk of being affected by virus. And this can be done by using our home tries tool. So the problem is when someone sneezes, oh, can you can you change the slide now? Uh, wait. Yeah. Uh, wait, sorry. sorry, the problem is when someone sneezes or co uh, cough, they feel they have a virus and then they rush to hospital, which increases their chance of getting infected. Due to this, hospitals and testing facilities are overcrowded and statistics say that there are more false positives in each state. Next slide, please. Here is some data which represents our hospital capacity. As we see, we are not much far away from the maximum capacity. A lot of people with mild or no symptoms can stay home and won't be able to, they don't need to visit a doctor. 
So it is very important to identify a correct positive patient with high and low risk in order to reduce the amount of people going to testing centers and clinics and to reduce the burden on healthcare system. So we intend to implement this using Paxta and construct a database of patient medical history. We feed into an AutoML platform. This will help us quickly construct a model that will allow us to determine whether an individual is at high risk due to the coronavirus and needs medical intervention through the analysis of their comorbidity. We intend to gather this data from state public health departments and create local models for each state. These indicators would help individuals at home input their medical history and receive a probability function of the severity of their case if they were to contract coronavirus. Similarly, doctors can use our model as an indicator to prioritize patients who are at the highest risk. In the case that we cannot receive this data due to HIPAA compliance, we intend to roll out an app that allows patients to voluntarily and anonymously fill out medical profiles that will build our model in real time. Uh, so we did talk to a couple of clinicians and key opinion leaders at Harvard University and they thought that our solution brings clinical value. As for our business model, we look forward to reaching out to different healthcare organizations to see if we can collaborate with them and they could help us with implementing our idea. We're also trying to reach out different department of health so to see if we can obtain data to train our model so we can implement our solutions as soon as possible. As Rafi mentioned, in case we're not able to obtain the data we need, then we will collect data from, our, from the user using our app, which will accumulate in our database over time, and the machine learning model will be trained once we obtain sufficient data points. We're also looking forward to talking to more key opinion leaders in the future to further refine our idea. So this is our team. Um, our team brings a diverse set of skills to the table from having technical skills to having medical knowledge that will help us in bringing our solution to the market. Thank you. And we're open for questions. Great. We have like about two minutes for questions. Hi guys, great presentation. Um, one question I had was, you know, if you guys had any sense from talking to clinicians or looking at the literature in terms of the added benefit that an ML model might do for your diagnostic tool. I mean, considering the st standard workflows that they use in the ER and criteria they're using, is there a benefit for the ML component? One of the strengths of AutoML is that if the public health departments give us the patient data, uh, AutoML models are very adaptable. So if there's a change in situation with how patients are reacting to coronavirus, the fastest way to detect that is actually using an AutoML model, as we will see data changes on levels that you would not see from visual inspection as well as within hospitals. Just some food for thought. I mean, a high false positive or, you know, a false um, positive rate isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? I mean, if we're, I mean, studies have shown that like a, a large number of people might also be asymptomatic carriers. Um, so, um, and how would this fit? Let's say, just to play devil's advocate, we have unlimited testing. Um, how would this then play into changes from the fact that, um, you know, one of the big challenges, if it was solved, like, does that detract away from the value of what you guys are proposing? So the way we want this implemented is actually as a side tool. So that doctors can kind of use it as an indicator. Not that it completely overshadows testing, However, testing takes time. Even if we have unlimited tests, to prioritize and figure out the patients which are the most likely to react negatively to the coronavirus. Testing is an option. However, testing takes time. Being able to just input data into this uh, AutoML algorithm will allow you to pinpoint the patients that need it the most. It will also help reduce uh, burden in healthcare because you know, a lot of people now, they just panic and they end up being at the hospital or the testing clinics and they didn't need a test. So this will also help us filter out those people who can just stay at home and self-quarantine themselves. And then that will allow, because we also talked to one of the clinicians and he said that, you know, we want to see people who are at the highest risk because they're really overwhelmed with patients right now. All right, thanks guys. That's all the time that we have. So we're gonna move on to our next group, which is We Can Sue It. So if you guys can share your screens and after that we'll have Metascale. So Metascale, uh, please prepare your slides for after this presentation. Yep, and just to make sure you guys know, this is our last two pitches. So we have 
We have week two Stewart and we have Metascale and then we will be breaking for judge deliberation. Hello, uh, can you guys see my screen? No, not yet. The share screen button should be at the bottom in the middle. It's a little green box. Oh, uh, I'm trying now. Uh, Shlo, can you set up the um, share screen, please? Great, Perfect. you can see it. Perfect. Uh, hello, my name is Sarthik, and I'm a representative from our organization, We Can Sell It. Next, please. Let's start out with the biggest issue that is affecting healthcare today, the immense lack of PPE, personal protective equipment. They're essential in the fight against COVID-19, especially the N95 mask. We aspire to solve the overall shortage of equipment, including PPE, which is affecting hospitals, nursing homes, and homeless shelters. We are projected to need 2 billion N95 masks by just this December. Doctors that we spoke to during our research say that they only have one N95 mask per week to use, which has a lifetime of eight hours. Due to this, as advised by the CDC, over 600 hospitals in the United States are now accepting homemade supplies. A popular myth that we would like to refute is that due to a significant increase in the production of N95 masks, the mask shortage will be solved soon. This is not true, as even then, doctors experience shortages daily and expect this to continue. There's also already an uneven federal distribution of supply in many states, including Michigan and Virginia. Officials say that 115,000 masks each day is only enough for one full day of statewide operations. We present We Can Sew It. We provide a platform for makers to create much needed resources easily with specific production guidelines on our site given by credible sources, such as Emory Healthcare and the CDC for making N95 mask covers, sewn masks, isolation gowns, and face shields. Makers can submit forms that tell us how many materials they made, and we guide them through the delivery process. Currently, we are in talks with roadies to set up same-day delivery service in all 50 states. Institutions can also submit forms telling us what they need and how much they need, after which we match them with local makers and provide a poster for their drop-off site. There have been many local efforts to sew masks as it aids in mental health as well, but there is no platform that allows makers and organizations to interact all across the United States and gives access to credible tutorials that ensure safety. This is especially true when we focus on nursing homes and homeless shelters. Most importantly, we uniquely distribute N95 mask covers, which allows healthcare professionals to reuse N95 masks. Dr. Ritwik Bhatia, one of our brave frontline healthcare professionals, confidently states that our distribution of homemade equipment will alleviate the effects of PPE shortage. 30 seconds. Nurse Connie Ryan from Florida had already started her own effort, but was even more excited once she saw, she saw our delivery process and commitment to supporting medical institutions and homeless shelters. In the near future, we will conduct research on new equipment and create a standard that we can measure all equipment by. Most importantly, we want to continue to empower our makers and healthcare professionals because together we can get through this crisis and ensure proper safety for all. Thank you for your time. We look forward to your questions and feedback. Zachary Paul, I have a question. What happens if somebody who's sewing it has COVID-19? Yeah, so this is a problem um, across the United States. Uh, there are actually many maker groups that currently exist to distribute supplies. Um, we Hospitals have sterilization processes that they go through before receiving the supplies, um, such as like UV radiation, etc. And so do you need to implement those into all these places? So those are actually already in place. The thing is the problem of potential contamination of incoming goods to hospitals is not a unique problem to masks, right? Like this exists in every single like supply that could come into a hospital at any point in time. The hospitals already have these procedures in place with like, I mean, masks specifically, they have sterilization processes, scrubs, gowns, et cetera. 
So it's being made at the homes, it goes to the hospitals, and then it's getting sterilized. Yeah, yeah. And this is like a pipeline that's been demoed across the United States already. We're just trying to make a centralized unit. Currently, it exists more like Facebook groups and things like that. Uh, so one thought is, I know that a lot of hospitals, uh, at least here in the Boston area, are sort of streamlining the way that they receive donations. Um, I mean, essentially, then what you're proposing is a mechanism for quick delivery, right? Are there any financials involved? Or is there any business plan? I know these are special times, but just broad question. Yeah, so there's an organization called Rody, which does delivery across the United States via like travelers in that going in that direction. And they've already demoed the use of Rody for like masks and other sorts of medical materials. Um, what we're trying to do is cooperate with them to create more of a centralized unit. Actually, on our website, which is live right now at weekensubit.org, um, we have like lists of hospitals along with the way they're currently receiving supplies. So we would like to mainly be a centralized source of information and slowly just expand better distribution channels to make it seamless. Like if you make something at home, you know exactly how to get it to a near facility in need. Great. Everyone, that's all the time we have. So next, we are on to our our last pitch of the afternoon. So with Metascale. Is anyone from Metascale here? You know it. It might be done. Let me try pinging them really quickly. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Nabrita from Medisco. Just give us uh, one minute. We're just going to start this. Hello. Hello, I can hear you. Yeah, uh, just give me a second. I need to start up the thing. And share the screen. Yeah. Sorry, this thing keeps flying out of my. Sorry, I've been clicking the wrong button for this. Uh, can you guys see the presentation? Is everything good? Hello? Yeah, we can okay. see it. Okay, great. Uh, hello, everyone. So, can I start? Yeah. Yes, please. In a COVID-19 world, how can, we, uh, how can we transport patients from dense urban areas to hospitals and fever clinics in a safe and efficient way? Hi, my name is Krishna, and Cabulance is our pitch to expand the medical transport system in a COVID-19 world. Like many other densely populated geographies, India is severely lacking in, the healthcare, in healthcare infrastructure. It has about one ambulance for every 100,000 people. That means that with the current ambulance system, there is a general shortage for typical demand. And because the distribution is biased towards metropolitan cities, it means that in the case of a massive infection spike, the entire medical transport system can get crippled almost instantly. So our solution, Cabulance, is a kit that will help us transform taxis into patient transport vehicles while addressing the needs of patient and driver safety. This allows us to tap into the ride sharing network and taxi networks to supplement the medical transport system. Now, the way this works will be that first, when a patient calls an emergency number, uh, a dispatcher 
will determine whether the patient needs a fully equipped ambulance or a cabulance. Then a nearby cabulance can pick up the patient and safely transport them to the nearest hospital or clinic. Once this is done, and a few sanitation steps later, the cabulance will be ready to go for the next patient. So in order to create a cabulance, taxis will be transformed using a retrofitting kit that we've designed. It's low cost, standardized and scalable. Our kit accounts for droplet and contact transmission and consists of four components. The first is a shield that, uh, se that separates the driver and the passenger. The second, a set of removable and reusable screens that can be attached to each surface in the passenger area. The third, a sterilizing device that can be used to clean up the surfaces. And finally, some consumables that will help improve the driver and patient experience. With some clever planning, we can try to ensure that this kit will cost no more than $500. So, in so finally, in conclusion, the impact of cabulance is at least fivefold. One, it, yeah. In one, it allows us to meet excessive patient demand during the infection spike. It makes transportation easier. It pre uh, preserves safety of the driver and the passengers. It allows for hospitals to reallocate its resources more in, uh, intelligently. And finally, it also provides opportunities for communities during crisis. Uh, we believe with Cabulance, we can better prepare ourselves to meet the challenges of the COVID-19 world where respiratory transmission will always be a risk. Uh, yeah, thank you. Questions? Uh, yeah, questions. How much is it going to cost uh, in total to be able to implement this in a place like India if you're expanding $500 per to how many um, taxis you need? So the way it might actually work, so we did spend a lot of time on this. Uh, I think Namrata can start off. Uh, I will add yeah, more. Uh, hi, uh, hi, actually, first we try to uh, understand what a particular kit will cost. So we calculated it that it will be within a, a variation from $300 to $500 per cap. And uh, we are trying to also uh, go for the extra number of ambulances or the um, this retrofitted caps, which will be required for each state. Each state. And uh, uh, Krishna just can go to that slide in which we have sold the number of uh, extra ambulances that would be required for the state. Yeah, so there's actually, there's a lot of weeds in this, but we can think about... Like yeah, so uh, what, what we did here is that, for example, you can see Andhra Pradesh. So right now, the number of ambulances is 439. But according to the food guidelines, we need an extra uh, extra uh, 100 more ambulances. So that we can collaborate with any other company like Uber or Ola, which are already dominant in the Indian market. And that many caps will account for that state. So just we can calculate for if for, if for one cap we need three hundred dollars. That's we multiply by the, that number of caps. So this is how we're gonna estimate the dimensions. And just to add another point to what she said, this is a small system that where you know you can have a very low volume manufacturing and you can scale it up to any size you want. And there, that means that you have the flexibility of having only ten cabs which are transformed into taxi. Uh, sorry. 10 caps which are uh, transformed into cabulances, or you have like a thousand of them which you can do it. And then you the cost goes down because you're doing more mass production. Um, I'm not I'm not well versed in the you know the Indian healthcare system, but can you comment on who pays? Uh, the people pay usually. In the case of this crisis, the government pays. Got it. Yeah. How much are you gonna charge people to use the cab? Uh, Actually, uh, right now, uh, right now the people uh, are paying one thousand to two hundred, twelve hundred for uh, if they want to want to go for the ambulance service. So um, first, uh, right now we have not decided on the financial. Uh, we'll decide once uh, it's implemented. Our base business model is making and selling the kits. So if we have a strategic partnership with somebody as big as Uber then they might want to do it for free because they have the money to actually front load all these cab rides. Uh, but so our particular sustainability and business model is only purely dependent on like 
what are the strategic partnerships we have? If we can work with the government, then we sell them the kids. If we work with Uber or Ola, we sell them the kids. In the long run, once the crisis is done, then we can work out a more equitable relationship on like just having uh, charging per patient transport. Chitrank and I were talking a lot about this, but in the current scenario, it's we didn't feel it was morally right to actually prioritize those conversations about what it would be in the long run. We would want to give out the kits as cheap as possible and make sure it's sustainable so that we can keep manufacturing more kits. And what do you guys do with sterilization in between, uh, in between rides? Have you guys thought about um, what type of regulations or regulations? Uh, we haven't gone through the exact guidelines because there is some discrepancy in the documents between what like WHO would say and what the Indian Council for Medical Research would say. But in general, from what I've, uh, from my experience in like lab experiences, using alcohol uh, for ethanol, ethyl alcohol for wiping or using a heavy dose of UV should work from what I've seen in the uh, Right now uh, also we have included the uh, UV, UV sanitizer, UV sanitizer for, the, for right now, a similar COVID situation and India was still in phase two. So in the upcoming uh, months, if uh, we go into a phase three, then this plan, this plan will be uh, this plan will be successful. All right, everyone, uh, that's all the time that we have. So thanks everybody for your presentation. Stephanie, I don't know if you have further instructions. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome, thanks. All right, so thank you guys so much. You did it. I'm so proud of all of you. This was amazing. The progress is incredible. You can tell all the work you guys put in. It really showed here. And I think you should all give yourselves a huge pat on the back for everything that you did this weekend, for the time you took to dedicate to trying to make a difference during this crisis. It's amazing. So what happens from here, we're going to disconnect this call. The judges will come back and deliberate. Um, somewhere around four o'clock Eastern, we're going to reconvene for the announcement of the winners and the closing remarks. Um, different teams are getting out of these pitches at different times, so it might not be right at four. So please stand by in your track channels around the four o'clock timeframe. It might be a little bit after. Um, and we'll send out the Zoom link so that we can all reconvene there. Um, no. Judges, please meet back in the Slack channel. We're gonna kick off a Slack call to get that moving. But we'll take a little break first. Um, and that is what we will do from here. Are there any kind of final questions before we break? No. Joshua, I see a hand. His hand's been up for um, the whole time, so Got I'm it. not, I don't <laughs> Everybody break. We're going we're gonna to end this call, and we're going to meet back, and again, mind your, the, the overall track channel. That's where we're going to send out the Zoom link to reconvene somewhere around four, somewhere in the next, like, 45 minutes or so. Thank you guys so much.